Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you for joining this learning experience brought to you by Portworks. My name is Cody and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning where we've got yet another exciting presentation ahead. Before we dive into things, I've got a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to review with everyone. First off, we're recording today's session. So if you happen to miss anything that we talk about, if you'd like to watch again later, or if you'd like to share this with your team, you'll be receiving the uh, recording via email as soon as it becomes available. And that'll be shortly after we conclude this live session today. Now, if you'd like to get involved, there are a couple of ways to do so. The first option is the easier option. It's to use the chat tab. That chat tab is on the right side of your screen. And when you find it, I'd like you to let us know from where in the world you are joining from today. Now for specific questions, we want you to direct those to the Q&A tab on the right side of that chat section. Sending in your questions just helps us keep organized. We want to do our best to answer as many of them as we can during our, our live program. So be sure to send those into that Q&A tab. Additionally, if you jump to the handout section, you'll see that there are a couple of resources there for you. So feel free to grab those. And of course, we will be selecting two of our most engaged attendees to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So be sure to stick around um, to, or sorry, be sure to send in your chats, your questions, and of course, fill out our post webinar survey to become eligible for that giveaway. So our topic today is an inside look at how Portworx by Pure Storage built an IDP or an internal developer platform. Today, I'm joined by Eric Shanks, Principal Technical Marketing Manager at Portworx. I'm also joined by Rajan Yadav, Director of Engineering at Portworx. And last but not least, we have Charudath Gopal, Platform Engineer here at Portworx. So Eric, Rajan, and Charudath, thank you all so much for joining us today. Eric, do you want to jump us right into our conversation? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, again, welcome. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, good morning in some cases. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar. Uh, I'm Eric Shanks. I'm a principal, principal technical marketing manager, uh, and I'll be your host today for our, our, for our webinar. We're going to be talking about how Portworks by Pure Storage built our own internal developer platform. But I am not the star of today's show. Um, the stars of today's show are both uh, Rajan and Charu. Rajan, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little about Thank about you, Eric, you. and really excited to be here. Um, uh, great to meet everybody. Uh, my name is Rajan. I'm the engineering director uh, at Portworks by Pure Storage. Uh, my team and I, we are responsible for the releasing the uh, Portworks line of products uh, with high quality. So I oversee quality engineering, uh, DevOps, uh, and infrastructure services, as well as DevSecOps. Uh, awesome. A little bit about me. I've been with Pure the, with the Pure team for a little over three years now, and it's been a really fun ride. Thanks, Rajan. And Charu? Hey, folks. Um, myself, Charu Dutt. I've been um, working with Rajan, and um, I, I'm the architect for the DevOps and the engineering team for the Portbox organization. Um, pretty much been working on engineering efficiency from the last seven years and excited for this talk. Thank you, Charu. We also have Jessica Christensen that is helping us backstage with some things around question and answers. Just wanted to give a shout to her. Thank you for all you've done to get this webinar up and running. Uh, speaking of questions and answers, we expect to have time at the end of this session for you to present your own questions to the team. Um, and if you want to do that, make sure that you post those in the Q&A section of the webinar. Uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, it might make sense for us to give you a little bit of background about what Portworks does so you can understand why we needed an IDP in the first place, right? So Portworks is a uh, software uh, company that focuses on providing container data management for Kubernetes. So we've got three main product lines, the first one being Portworks Enterprise, our flagship product. And what it is is software-defined storage that lives in your Kubernetes cluster so that it gives you enterprise capabilities that you would typically get from like a hardware storage array. We give that to you in software and it's baked directly into Kubernetes and is meant directly for uh, containers. And Kubernetes. Since we're all about putting stateful data in Kubernetes, that's, that's what our company does. Um, we also need to have a way to back up and restore that data now that we're storing it in Kubernetes. So we need a Kubernetes-aware Kubernetes backup product 
as well. And we have one of those as one of our is our second product. And then the third product is called Portworx Data Services. And it's a way for you to actually deploy managed databases in a Kubernetes cluster. So as opposed to having different Kubernetes managed services that you might use in like AWS or in Azure or on-prem, as long as you've got a Kubernetes cluster, we can deploy managed databases for you um, from our portal. So that's the pitch for Portworx. That's really all we want to talk about, about what our product does. We really want to focus on what we did to build an internal developer platforms so that we could get these products out to market faster. I thought it might be useful for us to have a little bit of a primer on what platform engineering is, just so we're all speaking kind of the same language here uh, before we get into how we actually built it. So I've got a couple of cartoon character type slides here to give an explanation of the way things used to be and the way they are now. So before DevOps, a uh, long, long time ago, when I was a young system administrator and didn't have quite as many gray hairs in my beard, um, this is the way we deployed software. A developer was saying, you know, hey, I've, I've written some code. I'm ready to get this code pushed to production or maybe a development environment, something like that. They couldn't do this themselves. They needed help. And the help came from a set of system administrators. So they'd have to reach out to a system administrator who was normally used to deploying you know, storage arrays and setting up firewalls and servers and all the infrastructure type things, they would be the ones that actually deployed the software on those servers. And of course, the system administrator would say, you know, sure, put in a ticket and we'll get to it. You know, And there was a tacit eventually listed there at the end of that sentence, right? Um, eventually that software was gonna get deployed, but you never really knew when. Uh, it just kind of depended on how busy the system administrator was. It wasn't great. We switched to DevOps. So DevOps model gave us the ability to have the developers deploy their own code because at the same time DevOps was becoming more and more prevalent, we also had this other thing in the industry that was happening, which was uh, public cloud started getting built and they were used uh, a lot. And that gave us an API to access our infrastructure. So that changed the way developers thought about code. Now uh, they can say, look, I've got code ready to deploy. I'm just going to use the API and provision it on my own server servers. I don't need to talk to that system administrator anymore. And this kind of um, came to a head when Werner Vogels famously said, you build it, you run it, right? So now the developers are able to build the code and run the code because they've got access to this API. They didn't have to talk to, to somebody else. So they started doing this. And the system administrators were still there, but they would say, look, hey, don't forget, you've got to do all the corporate compliance stuff when you deploy your code, right? Uh, you've got availability to think about, disaster recovery, how are you managing costs? How are you monitoring your application? Did you have encryption for it? Um, all of these things that the system administrators typically did to make sure that that code was secure and available. Um, but now that responsibility had moved on to the developers because they were de deploying and managing their own code. This got a little bit more tricky when, you know, they had to do all of those things, but then they also had to learn the APIs and like how to provision these things in different environments. So cloud one, cloud two, cloud three. Now all of those things I had to learn before are just amplified because now I've got multiple environments to deploy things to. And the developers were basically like, this is a lot of stuff to remember on top of my basically, my, my main job, which is writing code. Now I have to also learn all these other things that typically the infrastructure teams did for you. Um, it gets even worse when we've got lots of development teams. So imagine this scenario where we've got, you know, three developers, you know, in this case, we've got three different products that they're all deploying code for. Each one of those teams now has to learn all of this information, right? So we're pushing a lot of work up to the developers that they have to know and manage. And that's kind of where we got to platform engineering. So we still have our SMEs that are responsible for the infrastructure, things like the storage arrays and firewalls and servers. We still have our application developers who still want to be able to deploy their own code and manage that code, um, but we're giving them some help. So now we've got this layer in between them, and that's the platform engineering layer where our internal developer platform lives. And what we've done here is we basically bake in a lot of these capabilities into the IDP. So now uh, the developers have a lower cognitive load, things they have to learn, things they have to keep up with. They just know that when they're ready to deploy code, they're going to use the IDP and the IDP will deploy their infrastructure in the way that is best for the company around compliance standards and, and uh, availability restrictions and disaster recovery, things that they need to take care of. That's kind of done for them. And we give them an easy way that they can deploy and manage their own code. 
right? So now the developer says, I've got code ready. I'm just going to use the IDP, provision my infrastructure according to our corporate standards, and you're kind of done. So that's the basic primer on platform engineering, how we got here. And now let's talk to the experts and just uh, ask them some questions about how we built our own IDP. And I think to start this off, uh, I want to um, ask the question to Rajan. What problems was Portworx trying to solve when we built our own IDP internally? Can you tell us what problems we were encountering and like what made us go down this path in the first place? Uh, great. First of all, great introduction to platform engineering, Eric. Uh, you know, as you highlighted in your first uh, slide that Portworx uh, is a line of products, right? And me being responsible uh, and my team being responsible for delivering these products with high quality to our customers is of utmost uh, uh, importance to us, right? So let me kind of tell you the story, you know, when I joined the team, um, we were having these two a day calls, sometimes they would run for an hour. Uh, one was really around understanding how, what difficulties our uh, different engineering teams are having in terms of deploying and testing their code, whether it is the dev development team or whether it is uh, the quality team. Uh, and the other one was really about getting an understanding of how ready are we uh, to ship our products to production, uh, either on our SaaS platform or building and shipping our these container images that customers can deploy on-prem uh, to configure and set up Portworx Enterprise. And not only that, you know, the, the biggest pain point was, uh, uh, was discovered through a lot of interviews when I talked to these multiple development teams, and we're talking a team of more than 150 plus engineers. Um, we had the tools, we had the mechanisms to get the job done, but as you showed in the, uh, you know, the DevOps model, these engineers had to know everything uh, on what to do, where to go deploy things, and Portworx is a any any uh, kind of an offering, which means you know we uh, you know Portworx can be deployed on any cloud, on any Kubernetes distribution, and on top of that, almost any Linux distribution. So you can imagine the the plethora of combinations now one has to go through and understand how to configure these environments, how to set these things up, right? Um, and that was a huge complexity uh, for uh, somebody who has just joined the team, for example. The, the other challenge was, you know, we, before we released, right, uh, our code to production, we always had this criteria, you know, all of our pipeline jobs uh, should be passing. And again, we are talking 100 plus jobs just to make one release happen, which was, again, a challenging uh, thing for folks to manage and triage and understand where the failures are happening. Imagine scrolling through thousands of lines of Jenkins uh, log files or uh, you know other log files to figure out one thing that goes wrong, whether it could be in a deployment uh, or whatnot. And last but not the least, you know we always want to ship high, very highly secure uh, products uh, so our customers don't have to worry about uh, security at all. Uh, and you touched upon that as well. Uh, we wanted to make sure we are always compliant, not only when we deliver the products, but when we are you know testing them in house whether in the public cloud or on 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 prem and we had all, you know we had this these tools uh, and uh, you know uh, automation to do all this thing but when i spoke to the engineers you know their pain point was really around hey i really don't want to worry about this right i want the ability to be able to just write code push it and this this platform or this you know, I, I want feedback on my code ASAP. Uh, I shouldn't have to worry about you know, figuring out how many platforms or distributions I should go test my code on. How can you help me with that? Um, when I spoke to the managers uh, of the team or the leaders in the team, their main concern or the problem that they wanted to solve was how do we get visibility on a day-to-day -day basis on what's happening with the products that we are trying to ship to our customers, the new features we are building, how are they going? How are they doing? How do we build predictability into uh, our release model? Uh, so, you know, uh, our sales team or product managers can go and give uh, predictable dates to our customers like, yep, you're going to get this feature by this time. Right. And we looked around and what we really came up with, or we, so what, what that told me was, 
you know, we need this control center, right? Like, you know, when you have these traffic management systems or, um, you know, when you're running these large, like the Super Bowl is coming up, right? So you have this control center where you have information uh, ar around almost everything that's happening during the game. And we imagine that, like, how can we bring all of this together so our developers do not have to leave that platform at any given point of time, from the time they stop writing code to the time it's pushed to production. How do we provide this ability to our leaders and the dev and uh, QA managers to be able to get the pulse of how things are going uh, in terms of uh, the code, making it through the different stages of the pipeline? And while doing all of this, how do we stay compliant with the company? Uh, you know, uh, best practices are around uh, uh, deploying secure codes and secure environments uh, in public clouds as well, uh, as well as an on-prem. And we had a lot of on-prem infrastructure. Uh, so we wanted, you know, we, we thought about like, why can't we provide a public cloud-like experience to our uh, engineers as well? And that was the beginning of our journey uh, where we uh, thought of building this control center. Awesome. Can, can you give us a little bit of a, a feel for the scale or the scope of this? Like how many, I know we talked about we have three main products, but how many teams are we supporting or how many developers are we really supporting? Yeah. So, you know, uh, when I when I started uh, uh, with the team, uh, we were eight, team, eight different teams. We were at 100, or 100 odd engineers. The team has grown to 150 plus engineers now. Um, it was only two product offerings. Then we added Portworx data services. Uh, so that increased the complexity and the interoperability of, you know, what we need to build, ship and test. Uh, it was, uh, it's, it's a large initiative uh, as well as, you know, the, the scale is really about, as I mentioned, right, the complexity of the testing matrix. Uh, you know, when you support, you know, any scale, any cloud, any distribution, we're talking like, you know, 50 plus kernels, uh, from these different, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, Linux kernels or multiple Kubernetes distributions and then any cloud. Thank you. I appreciate that. That that does make sense. Uh, okay, so Charu, over to you. So we've got these problems internally with the way we develop software. What did we do to solve that? Can you walk us through this? Cool. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Rajan. So uh, what prompted us to build this IDP? You know, before we even get started, as Rajan was uh, saying, right, you know, we started doing this um, interviews. We started talking to folks internally and try to understand what is the problem, right? And based on that, we came up with an expectation matrix. Um, and, you know, the last thing we wanted to do was reinventing the wheel, right? So the challenges which, uh, which uh, were in front of us were like, uh, you know, make the on-prem infrastructure reliable, which is literally the foundation of everything we wanted to do and uh, reduce the burden for engineering teams of prolonged testbed deployment time, like which involves 100 plus combinations of Linux distributions, on-prem, Kubernetes, uh, other, other cloud platforms, and you know, there comes um, different Portworx product as well, right? So there, was a too, there were too many combinations to support. And the next one was CI CD, uh, where engineers were spending a lot of time in triaging and debugging. And the last one, but not the least, is um, you know we wanted to help our team ship the product in the most secure way. That's where uh, security scanning comes into picture, right? So based on these requirements, we started looking at some tools or solution out in the market. Uh, none of them were you know were like tailored for our needs. Uh, there were solutions where you know which you gave high level orchestrations uh, and such, but we had to build that. Um, back end or we had to build that intelligence and logic to make all these things you know get all these things work, working that is when we built uh, an idp for portworx a portworx platform engineering innovation called ato studio so going forward wherever we say atos that means our uh, you know that's our idp uh, atos has multiple feathers in its hat uh, what you're seeing here in this slide um, uh, which is which talks about infrastructure eas uh, atos stream pipelines and uh, security image scanning these are some of the major ones which made like huge impact. Uh, here is the first one, it was private cloud. What was the problem here? Um, imagine this, you have uh, 200, plus, uh, 200 plus physical servers and more than 50 clusters with whatever virtualization technology you want to use. And all these things are being used by engineers in silo. 
and irrespective of their role, every engineer needed to understand the hardware and virtualization layer to get better output from them. And the worst, everyone needed to be aware of servers, clusters, networks, et cetera, they need to use. And they were literally using this information in their test to you know, deploy, run, run the show. And not to forget the issue with uh, over or uh, underutilized hardware resources, because everything was in silo. The, we did not have a very good observability and monitoring in place. Everything looks chaotic, isn't it? So um, this prompted us to develop one of our foundational feature. Uh, it was private cloud and everything, you know, we go with an API first um, mindset. So everything is API based and you have, we have a UI layer sitting on, on top of it. So what these APIs provide, so um, right from the cluster, um, you know, uh, from, from the place where we start the deployment, find, we, we help find the right cluster or the right hardware, depending upon whether you are a QA, dev, or marketing, which team you come from, we give you the right hardware to go ahead and do the deployment. And uh, these APIs even provide rebalancing capabilities where depending upon the hardware uh, usages, it actually goes and picks up the right cluster where uh, you know which, which has enough resources to go ahead and do the deployment and the other thing uh, you know with these deployments are um, you need to stop you need to know when to stop doing the deployments on on these uh, hardware resources or these on, on these clusters because what happens is if um, you know if you cross a certain cpu memory or storage threshold then you're not only jeopardizing the new deployments you're trying to do you're actually um, hampering the one which are already running. Existing tests may also fail, right? So we have a mechanism, we have guardrails built where um, the ADOS um, a private cloud API stop users from deploying on, on some, some of these um, uh, clusters when they reach a certain threshold. And the last one um, uh, is like lease and quota management. So this is this is really important. I'm going to talk about it more when I, when I get into the demo slides. Um, and today, we are reaping the benefits of ATOS Private Cloud. We are doing efficient cluster rebalancing, enhanced pipeline stability. We have a very nice quota and release management. What is the impact which this has created, right? So we have drastically reduced cloud cost by left shifting some of the deployments to on-prem. So our on-prem is capable of running high performance test beds today. Because of that, we were able to run a lot of testing. We are able to do a lot of testing on on-prem. On and in FI24, we saved more than $1 million because of the benefits of private cloud. And um, our team today, you know, a group of 150 engineers, as Razan mentioned, and we run 9,000 high performance virtual machines at any given point of time. That's where we are. Yeah, just a quick question for you, Char. Um, the, in your first benefit, you said we saved a million dollars, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. might have gone on to the next slide. I can't, I'm not sure. Um, I was wondering where that cost savings pr predominantly came from. Is this from moving stuff on prem? Is this doing it more efficiently on prem, or is this based on those quotas? Like, where did that money come from? So um, it is a combination of um, just the sorry. It, it is a combination of saving the resources based on lease and quota management, and also making sure that we use our hardware uh, efficiently. So that you know, there were some hardware which was not being used properly at all. So instead of going and buying this new hardware out uh, from the market, we repurposed this and used it in a better way, and we made this direct saving of one million dollar, which we should have, we would have ended up you know going buying new hardware. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, and to add to what Charu said, uh, you know, I definitely can agree to us not having the need to continue to buy more and more hardware because we are utilizing the existing one more efficiently. The other is, you know, there's sometimes there was no need for us to go do like, you know, uh, high scale testing uh, in the cloud. The only reason some of our teams are doing it was because they didn't have a reliable on-prem infrastructure or, you know, so we, we were able to move such uh, workloads on-prem uh, once we had this better uh, private cloud-like experience. Makes sense. Thanks. Thank you, Chara. So the next one is ATO's uh, environment as a service. Um, the need of ADP was much more evident in this area. The whole engineering team, DevOps, QA, Dev, ev like we were all literally spending a lot of time either in preparing the test beds or waiting for the test beds to be prepared. So we were dealing with a lot of complexity here, as I told earlier, right? Like 100 plus Linux, uh, Linux uh, OS kernels, combinations, multiple cloud platforms, 
and we were devops team were getting back to back request you know and a lot of them were getting queued as well and we had another issue in our hands too um, multiple infrastructure and automation frameworks a lot of tribal knowledge which no one wanted to remember and operate so um, side effect of this as any smart engineer would do dev and qa folks they got approval from managers and they started moving to cloud for deploying these kubernetes clusters and test beds right because on prem was not reliable and deployments used to take very long time because of this complex uh, some of the complex frameworks we had and um, they thought okay it's okay to go ahead and deploy this in cloud and the worst you know using cloud resources for testing is not a bad idea but keeping them over weekends given the complexity of creating all these things increased our cloud cost drastically so that's when we came up with this solution eas today with uh, etos uh, eas we have the self service model where everyone can come deploy the test bits on demand without any tickets without any manual intervention and of course uh, you know not to forget the different uh, tribal knowledge of you know cli options i, I spoke about so we have the benefits of rapid test bed deployment today uh, we give a hybrid cloud experience you can go ahead and use the portal to deploy these test beds on on prem cloud uh, you know we support multiple clouds here and um, um, we have come up with an approval based mechanism where uh, anybody who wants to do a cloud deployment see what happens is with with uh, great power comes great responsibilities right so people had this one click deployment of going and deploying in cloud so everybody started doing this, then you know, that will also impact in a negative way right so that's where we came up with an approval based mechanism where for every cloud deployment there is a message which goes to the manager the message, it probably take 10 seconds for the managers to look at the message and hit on a button so that the deployment will get approved and we go ahead and complete the deployment this is just to make sure that the team manager and uh, everybody is responsible and aware of what's going on right coming to the impact we have saved approximately 15000 engineering hours in the last 8 uh, months that's when eas was um, uh, you know uh, went live and uh, we have eliminated the ticketing process and today the devops team is spending time in new innovation and new initiatives rather than working on you know creating the setup and such and also uh, with eas and with the help of private cloud we have reduced the cloud cost by more than 50% in uh, 50% in fi24 uh, you know compared to the previous years So it sounds like this is super useful for the application developers and things but I have a, a question here and maybe this is uh, directed at, at Rajan. Um you've got all these developers that have already been using their own tools like Terraform or CI CD pipelines or scripts or something to deploy their infrastructure. Did you have to do anything to force those developers to start using the IDP? Did they want to come to the IDP just because it was easier to use? and i'm also wondering if you had to do any prodding with leadership to to get leadership buy in to actually use an idp or something like this maybe you can you can talk to how we got people to start uh, embracing the idp uh that's a great question eric so you know the answer is we had to do a little bit of all um they we first of all we we once we did the interviews we understood the user's journey you know our our developer's journey and you know we we used a very design thinking approach to build an empathy map what are the pain points they have uh so the first goal was to always build a better experience than what currently existed right and be able to showcase the value add of why then they don't have to use the way do the do the way they were doing uh, earlier um we did a lot of road shows once we built you know once we built the mvp once we started you know launching it you know like went went to our alpha beta stages and collected a lot of feedback um so a lot of folks started adopting it you know uh, it started with some of the junior engineers because the senior engineers had their as you mentioned right they have their way of doing things they had their terraform scripts uh, everybody is al always going to automate uh, to reduce the manual overload Uh, so we built a better uh, experience right and then we, once we did the road shows we showed it to the managers um and we pull and then we started pooling all these resources under this private cloud so you know we we shared with them the pain point of having these disaggregated resources some underutilized some overutilized um and they really understood and they you know they gave us a chance to allow to you know collate, collate all the hardware that we had under this one umbrella um we provided them guaranteed resources we also you know had dedicated resource for certain teams as well where their entire team could go and use things 
So uh, the journey uh, was really about be building a better product at the end of the day for internal co internal consumption. Uh, and you know we, we were tracking the metrics on who's using what, where folks are falling off. Like we have a nice UI for our IDP. If folks are not using it enough, what are the pain points? And we opened up multiple forums for them to give feedback. And within the IDP itself, we have a 24 seven Slack support channel. Um, then we would all, of course, they could always file tickets on us uh, to ask for, uh, you know, uh, more features over there. Thank you. Appreciate that. Charlie, I'll let you get back to your presentation before I interrupted. No problem. Thank you. So the next one um, is ATO stream pipelines. So one may think that you know we don't even need an IDP for running pipelines, right? We already have a lot of solution uh, in market, um, and uh, and yes, we also use some of these solutions which is available in the market, right? But ATO's orchestrator here is a game changer. So I'll give two examples um, uh, here. Uh, one is the CI/CD pipeline orchestration. So we follow a step-by-step -step approach, which is designed to fail fast by left shifting the core functional uh, or core um, test cases and you know running them as soon as a change gets into the our repository right and this is to reduce the surface surface impact so we don't want like 150 engineers running like 1000 pipeline and they all failing for the same reason right that's the last thing we wanted and uh, ados orchestrator helps uh, you know um, build this recommendation logic where we have multiple stages, uh, unit testing, and then the core functional and the functional test cases and the system test cases. So all these different stages, they flow from one stage to another only when there is a recommendation from the previous stage. So if you have a bug, if you have something in the previous stage, that change will not even be picked up for the next stage, right? And um, with the help of this model, um, you know, our, our SaaS product, we do a release within like four to five hours at max. So once the change gets into the, our repository within five hours of SaaS product, you know, we are we are ready to ship it to our customers. So that's how efficient it is. And um, uh, the mode of uh, ATOS is like you know to make engineering uh, teams' life easier, right? They, we wanted them to start debugging right from the browser. We don't wanted them to go ahead and log into the machine to see what what's happening. And given that uh, Portox is a storage solution, you know uh, we collect stats like uh, network storage, VM, CPU, memory, etc. Right. So this is very important for them to understand where the bottleneck is, why a test is failing, right? And all this information is right available from the browser. They can take a look at it. They can correlate the error messages in the logs and they can, you know, understand what's going on. So that, that's what we bring into the table. And the next one is unattended distro pipelines. This is something um, we were, we are very excited about. Uh, and very recently we, we don't even finished this project. So think of this one, right? You have a lot of kernel versions, distro versions coming in which you need to support. And for every distro, we have a kernel pipeline, like, you know, which is out in the market, uh, uh, which is coming in. There are new kernels, which is coming in on a daily basis. So the requirement was, um, you know, we had a team. The team's responsibility was to take a look at all the new distros coming in, take a look at all the new kernels, which is coming in for every distros and run pipelines on them and make sure that everything works, right? Today, with unattended distro pipeline, we have built an engine which will keep track of all these new kernels, all the new distributions, and it will publish to a dashboard on a daily basis. I'll, I'll show the dashboard in, in the next couple of minutes. And the next step was to build an orchestrator. For every kernel coming in, we have a pipeline which kicks in and runs the bare minimum test, which is required from the product side to make sure that you know this kernel uh, uh, to validate port works on these kernels. So, um, and today we don't have the dedicated team doing that. They're doing better things today. Right, rather than babysitting the kernel versions and distro versions and running the pipelines, they just look at these failures only when they get their notification. If not, everything is unattended. Everything happens uh, underneath. So, so if, you're basically saying then that anytime a new Linux distribution comes out, our software is tested on it, and we know yeah. whether or not it works. Yeah. Probably before we knew that there was a new distribution that came out. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Very yes. Cool. Yeah. So uh, that's one of the impact. As I told, we don't have that dedicated team, and you know it has uh, enhanced the engineering productivity. And because of the CI/CD pipeline orchestrations we are doing, we have consolidated the pipelines. Because you know, one of the important thing is we need visibility on what's going on, 
right? So that's what uh, these pipelines um, provide. We, we provide the capability of viewing all these things from one dashboard, from one place. I, I'll show that in the demo. The so next one, um, security, right? This was our next challenge. As every product, we had this responsibility of scanning, remediating, and shipping security mates to our uh, customers, right? And our customer, you, they own different registries, and they had different scanning tools. And um, also our compliance and gov governance team, they wanted us to track the S-bomb for every release, like for all the Portworx products, which was literally manually impossible given that we do 25 releases per year and we use like 100 plus open source packages, right? And coming to our development team, poor guys, their, their requirement was very simple. They wanted a simplified process and a single pane of glass where they can see all the scanning results and you know um, eliminate the false positives and give fine-grained reports to point to them in the right direction. Because the problem with them was um, they were going and um, you know building this um, uh, new, new product, new software, and um, there are multiple, as I told them, our customers are using multiple registries, marketplace, multiple tools they had to run this in multiple places right and again we had a team they were literally doing all this scanning triaging and remediation and then giving a report to our developers and management and it used to take five to seven days and again this you this came with a lot of false positives as well right so that's where we ended up working on this solution we embarked on this journey of you know automating this whole process and providing devsecops as a service we use multiple industry standard tools, uh, which avoids false positive and also providing the capability of viewing all these things from one place. Impact, um, today we have the ability to perform on-demand scans, not just by the engineers, it could be even the release management team leaders, anybody can go ahead and do this one or two click scans. And this takes 30 minutes. This literally take 30 minutes to complete instead of five to seven days. Yeah. That's yeah. what we bring into the table. Yeah, I'd like to add something here to Eric, right? Uh, the reason we we use multiple tools in house is because you know you can imagine you know different companies, different uh, they all have their uh, choice of tools, whether it's like a Palo Alto Networks or Lacework or Aquasec or cloud providers, um, and why they wouldn't even allow you know downloading an image if a vulnerability is found in the image, even with a score of like seven sometimes, right? So that was one thing. Now, the other challenge here was that once you run the scans from these tools, these tools are really good at telling you like, yeah, these, these are all the packages that have these vulnerabilities, but they, you know, they're getting better. Uh, some tell like, yep, yeah, these vulnerabilities are fixable because there's a community fix available on these open source packages. They still have these different uh, scoring systems sometime. Uh, one one tool uh, or one scanner will give a very critical score to the same uh, package, whereas the other one would not. Uh, on top of that, uh, you know the the other challenge is how do you you know merge all of this information together and present it to the developer in a format where they can only work on what is critical to fix, right? That is, at the end of the day, that's one of the problems we were trying to solve. Like, we do not want the developers to spend time uh, parsing these results and figuring out you know, what is fixable, what's not fixable. Uh, and so, I just wanted to share that you know, it, it's that's why it used to take such a long time because it would go through multiple teams. First, with a small, very small DevSecOps team who would be doing this job, then opening tickets then going back and forth with the developers on, oh, well, yes, we can fix it, or no, why should we fix it? So we wanted to make that uh, job easy and then let the developers, again, you know, not burn their brain cells, but just focus on what is critical uh, to ship our products with high quality and uh, security. Makes sense. Thank Thanks. you. So let's get into the high-level design. So, um, you know, ATOS is not built for one team or product, right? So the philosophy here is we wanted uh, to give a smartphone kind of experience to uh, anybody who wants to use ATOS, right? Like, you know, uh, you install app on top of your mobile and use it however you need. So we have built this platform where anybody, anyone can come and plug in their solution and then, you know, get that uniform experience. Um, if you see the first one, we are talking about the REST APIs here. So we have like five core microservices, which is running uh, this beast of an application. We have the notification, observability, and scheduler uh, layer as well integrated within. 
and irrespective of who you are for example you are from the sec security ops or devops test automation you know you 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 are a team running some jenkins pipelines cd pipelines whatever it is right we give that uniform experience here and frameworks you can bring bring our plug come and plug in your framework so we have our own frameworks which is written we use some third party frameworks as well everything is integrated and we give that uniform experience for the engineers so we have this beast of an application right and um, we need an equally majestic infrastructure to deploy and run these applications so here in portworks we practice what we preach and the whole ato studio what you are what you are seeing and what we just spoke about everything runs on portworks product 100% of our devops um, internally use applications whatever we have today everything is deployed on top of our portworks products we have a dr dog fooding environment which is built with kubernetes red hat openshift and portworks storage solution um and you know um, it, it's been a, a tremendous journey so far um I'll, i'll talk about the design so uh, if you see this design um uh, you know um you don't you don't <laughs> so there is uh, I, I have heard a lot of people talking about this one, right? They say like, okay, if you want reliability, you need to go out and deploy things in cloud. Uh, if not, uh, you know, uh, things will fail. You will not get you will not get consistent results. I disagree with that point. You need to know how to design the infrastructure and how to design your deployment architecture in the right way. So when you do that, you can get the similar kind of results in on-prem. So the stack, what I'm talking about, it is actually deployed on-prem. We have a source. and a destination we have a dr setup uh, we have a, a site a site b uh, both sites has kubernetes clusters and on top of it we have uh, portwork stretch cluster because we have both you know stateful and state uh, stateless applications of atos running on top of it and um, uh, let me tell you this one atos is a single point of failure for all the portwork day to day operations uh, all our ci cd pipelines eas private cloud everything you know if they want to operate atos is required and we are running all these things in on top of it and more than that we do fail over every month we do you know if not because of hardware um, one of the server having issues which issues fail over something like that or if not we induce fail over and fail over from site a to site b or site b to site a every month and it's been more than 1.5 years like you know easily uh, one and a half years we are running this and we never had a downtime Yeah so for our audience members that may be not familiar with Portworks this is actually our our flagship enterprise product so uh in the 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 slide you've got up with the deployment architecture we've got two different kubernetes clusters that are in different sites that are less than 10 milliseconds of round trip latency between them and we're using a feature of our storage cluster that lives in the kubernetes cluster called portworks dr or synchronous dr where any writes written to your persistent volumes on one cluster are also written to another cluster so that if you lose a node or you lose your entire cluster or your site for example you can just fail that over to another site this is one of the things that we do with our software that we sell cool thanks eric let me move on to the next slide stats and scale of operation so you know I, you, there were a couple of questions which eric asked and rajan was answering right like you know how is the adoption going you know how is your team really using it and all those things right Uh, you know what we believe is um, you can go out and build a an world class product and if you don't have the right users if you don't have people using it it's meaningless what do, what is the what is the use of such product which nobody uses right so if you take a look at this slide um, we are a team of 150 engineers and we deploy easily 6000 virtual machines on a daily basis at any given point of time we have 9000 virtual machines running but 6000 virtual machines there is a churn rate they get deployed deleted on on a daily basis and that is possible because of the solid infrastructure we have and the solid private cloud apis we have which actually restricts and manages and deploys in, in an efficient manner um uh, per quarter at any given point of time we deploy like 50000 test beds uh, throughout the quarter and which is equivalent to approximately 250000 virtual machines cloud cost saving as i told earlier you can see the graph here the cloud cost is going down as as we started adopting eas private cloud and other features right so and we have typically 300 plus physical servers which is supporting us uh, at this point of time 
Yeah, what's most interesting to me is the two graphs, if you overlay them, right? The number of deployments are going up, but the costs are actually going down. So that yeah. seems like a win. Yeah, yeah they, they, you know, for me, 150 seems like a small team, but you see, we do 1,000 deployments, 1,000 desperate deployment per day. And yeah, indeed, thanks for noticing it. Yeah. The chart goes down and on-prem deployment is going up. That's where the reliability comes into picture. Awesome. And can you show us it? Yeah, there's the demo. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. Let me take you to the demo. Uh, just give me one second. Okay. I hope you are able to see my screen. Looks good. So, yeah, this is our portal. All uh, right. Um, anybody can come and they can, you know, uh, start uh, deploying a test. The experience is very simple. Go ahead and click this button. Uh, you can select the product and you can select what kind of um, platform you want to use, right? Whether it is on prem, AWS, GK, AKS, whatever it is. And then let's say that I want to do a um, setup and install Kubernetes and get Portworks installed on top of it, right? Uh, Everything, you don't have to change anything, but in case if you want to change, right, for example, the OS or the Kubernetes version, you know, how many days you want, leaves you want to keep, you can feel free to make those changes and just hit the deploy button. Depending upon what kind of uh, deployment type you use, it will take 30 minutes to one hour to complete the deployment. For the benefit of this demo, I have picked up this example, uh, which is the same where, uh, you know, we have the Kubernetes uh, setup completed, right? So ATOS makes it very easy and simple for anybody to come and um, manage their test bed. So it gives information about who deployed for what product, what branch we are using, all this information, right? And the most important thing is if you go ahead and expand the test bed section, it gives information about what is this test bed? Like how many virtual machines are there on this? What is the you know server cluster data center being used? And when it's going to expire, right? all this information. So this has Kubernetes installed. You have the kube config available. And let's say you want to extend the lease. You can you know, hit this button and go ahead and extend the lease anytime you need. And if you want to whitelist a test bed, you can whitelist a test bed. So why do we have this whitelist test bed feature is uh, we have this uh, long running test cases where uh, you know um, we have the longevity team. They run tests for like two months, three months. We don't want to delete those test beds. We just we want to keep the test beds for a very long time. So we have given this capability for folks to go ahead and whitelist the test bed and keep for long uh, time so that our reapers, which is the lease and uh, quota management as part of that, right? We have a reaper running. Those reaper ignore this whitelisted test bed. So the another part is tax. This is a very powerful feature of uh, ATOS. See, you know, um, I, another philosophy is like, you know, we won't, don't, did not want it ATOS to be a burden for anybody. We wanted it to be a boon. So all our frameworks are integrated such that we mine this information, we pull this data about what is the kind of deployment you have, what is the container runtime, uh, you know, what is the kernel version, and what is the Kubernetes version, all such things. So tomorrow, when the management comes to me and asks, like, you know, can you give me an, a report of how many Kubernetes deployments you did, how many passed, how many failed, how many port works, or what are the different port works we tested over the last 24 hours? We can go generate all such data uh, within just click of a button. That's the power of ATOS. Um, yeah, so as I told, this is the stats where you can click on the stats. I'm not going to show it because it has some sensitive information with IP addresses and all. So when you click on it, you can see uh, information about what is the VM, how they are looking, what is the MEM CPU used, and all those things for in-depth debugging. And ATOS logs here, we do auto triaging and collect some logs, which will help uh, folks in going and debugging the issues. So let's move on to the next one, which is the pipeline view. Uh, see, in this example, I'm, I've filtered for an engineer. So I just selected one engineer. They can come and see, and this is for L2 uh, stage. So they have certain pipelines running. So this view makes it e easier for the engineer. They can select number of days, seven days, 30 days. They'll get a view of all their pipelines in one place. How many passed, how many failed, and we make it very easy. What, you know, we have different legends. What we say is, if something has failed with infra error, don't even look at it. That's the responsibility of the DevOps team. If it has failed because of some other reason, we want them to triage it. You are seeing two colors here. That means that it has failed, but somebody has triaged the run. This is where it is very handy for the management to come and see how their team are you know, looking at the pipelines, whether they are really doing the triage, 
tracking the bugs, they get all this information from this view. And this is one more product we have, PDS, um, you know, um, Portworx data services, and you can look at the pipeline here. Like, you know, they run these pipelines on a daily basis. And you, you are seeing some red failures here. We don't, you know, our motto is not to make this pipeline uh, green all the, all the time. Our, our motto is not to show green pipelines all the time. Our motto is to make sure that the changes are coming in and we catch the bugs as soon as possible. So yeah. the responsibility of the engineering team is to go and make sure that once the failure comes, go fix it and, you know, make it stable. That's, where, that's what you're seeing here. Yeah, Rajan, you were about to say something. Right. So uh, I think I, I just wanted to add here, uh, Eric, as I was saying earlier, right? Uh, this is the control center that that serves those different personas and teams and, uh, you know, engineers all the way from, from your uh, freshly joined engineer to the manager of the VP. Uh, you know, it makes their job easy. Uh, you see the legend and all, right, uh, where they don't have to even worry about triaging a failure if if it falls into the category of installation or infrastructure issues and this all came from the feedback like you know so that they can uh, from these engineers so they they have to spend less less and less time in worrying about the infrastructure issues yeah i think i was originally expecting this to look a lot like a ci cd pipeline but it looks like we're doing all the things that you're doing after the deployment that's super important for us um which is awesome i love it Cool. Uh, I'll, I'll take another couple of minutes uh, before we take the qu uh, question and answers. So the next one is the private cloud. So this view, uh, this is where folks, they can come and manage the test beds. We have a quota for how many test beds our engineer deploy as well. So we support only four. Uh, at any given point of time, an engineer need more than four test beds. They have to delete the old ones and deploy new ones. This is to make sure that everybody gets an, an opportunity to go deploy the test beds as and when they need. And uh, another important thing is, um, you know, uh, let's say um, my manager wants to see uh, what's going on under uh, his team, right? Like what is the number of deployments happening? They'll get the report as well. So if you see here uh, under Rajan, uh, we have 944 active test beds and approximately uh, 2400, sorry, uh, 4400 VMs up and running. So this gives um, uh, an understanding of how the team is doing, depending upon the product, you know, where they are using it. You, you can choose between different cloud as well, like where and all we are deploying, IBM, EKS, AKS, GKE, whatever it is, you can select and see how the deployments are going on. So there are there's a lot to cover. Um, okay, so this is a distro dashboard. This is what I was talking about for every kernel, you know, um, yeah, whenever there is a new kernel, the, the entry comes and sits here and we automatically run. And whenever we find an issue, you know, we, we block it and uh, we say something is failing and the respective team uh, will go ahead and check. And you click on it, you see information about, uh, you know, this is the data for the last 30 days. The, for this kernel, we ran this many times. It failed once because of some test error and other times it has passed. So this is, this is the view which the management uses to generate the reports. Yeah, so the last one is on the security. So uh, this is what I was talking about. I have just opened an existing scan rather than starting a scan. Uh, this is the this is the view our um, development team was asking. Right? They, they were asking, I need a place where I can see all the scans which has happened and I can see where it failed, where it passes. This is that one single pane of class which we are providing, uh, experience which we are providing for our engineers to um go ahead and um, remediate the issue in a eff efficient way yeah so let me get into the q a yes section yeah uh awesome thank you so much for the demo the the product actually looks awesome uh, maybe we should be selling it i don't know um uh want to switch over to some questions real quick we've got a few questions in the queue already and we got about seven minutes to do it so i'm just going to publish these to the screen and uh, I'm assuming either Charu or Rajan will answer these and not me. Um, published one to the screen. I don't know if I see it. I'll read it out loud. Um, is this full grown platform or are you using third party or OSS products like Backstage? Um, also observability is a main challenge for microservice based applications. Do you have any of that in, in, the, uh, in the portfolio? So um, we everything what we are developed here, right? We are, we are not used any third party um, uh, software or anything. Everything is homegrown. Home, uh, we you, we have used um, 
uh, Angular JS for the UI, and we use Python, and everything is a Python-based microservice. Um, and um, what was another question? Sorry. So I think the question is, you know, um, uh, I can I can chime in too. Uh, yes, the the IDP is homegrown, right? But as we showed you the architecture, um, this IDP brings all the different uh, components or services that are required to build and ship secure products and high quality together, um, right? Uh, and you need the, I mean, you need an infrastructure to run it. And uh, because we had, we wanted to adopt a modern, uh, you know, platform, we chose Kubernetes and then Portworx became the de facto choice for us uh, because we have uh, persistent uh, or stateful applications where we need to store uh, data and uh, or logs. Uh, so we, we it's a combination of uh, all those things. For observability, you know, we again use standard open source tools, Prometheus, Grafana, um, right? Uh, we, we use the APIs for these different services to uh, pass the metrics to uh, that as well. Yeah. So another question that came in, uh, one of the challenges identified in building an IDP is vendor lock-in. Uh, besides diversifying architecture platforms, can using open source alternatives also make an impact? Yeah, I mean, uh, as Charu mentioned, right, we use open source components. We use open source components to build our IDP. You know, I mean, we use a very, one of the most famous programming languages, Python, to to build these microservices. Uh, we are using the open source MongoDB, uh, or sorry, uh, we are using the Portworx data services, but you can use uh, any database, uh, NoSQL, or, you know, even you can use SQL if you want. Uh, so it, it really depends on the, I think, the use case. Uh, and how far do you want to take your IDP? Yeah, and you know, change is inevitable, right? Change is constant. So um, we, uh, for example, we support some cloud deployment. Whenever there is a changes which is done on the cloud provider side, right? We have to go ahead and update our automation to make sure that things work. So that's a continuous process, and that will happen always. Yeah, one thing we didn't touch upon is uh, we have a CI/CD for this IDP platform itself, right? Yeah. So before. So we catch, we, we, we also have like a CI CD pipeline or this ATO stream pipeline to test the IDP code itself. So, you know, we make sure that nothing is broken when, when our, you know, our customers wake up in the morning and, and, you know, they're having their coffee and then just click on environment as a service, for example. And I think you answered the next question, which is what do you do when the provider makes a change? And I think we're saying there's always going to be change to the IDP. Someone's got to manage that. Um, so you're going to have to keep up with those updates as well. Um, hopefully, the cloud providers aren't changing things too often. Yes, uh, it happens though. We have seen backward compatibility uh, breaking, right, uh, in the APIs and all. And the best, you know, you we we also use best software engineering practices there, where we have continuous unit testing, functional testing uh, for for our platform itself. And the last question that came in from the audience was, do you use PVs or persistent volumes? And I'll answer that one. Of course we do. Yes, that's literally what our company was built to do is help you deploy and manage your persistent volumes and provide those enterprise capabilities like replication, encryption, you know, all of those things on top of that. So absolutely. Yeah, and, and as Charu mentioned, right, uh, one of the requirements that we came uh, up with was we need to make sure we have zero downtime on this IDP uh, because the uh, the impact of uh, you know it, this being down is very high. You can imagine, you know, even if we lose, we have a thirty minute downtime. We're talking uh, almost two hundred hours of lost productivity across the entire uh, team. So that's why we used the asynchronous, uh, sorry, synchronous DR or the Metro DR functionality of Portwork Enterprise because you know these PVs and all they are replicated. Uh, in real time, uh, and you know uh, the failover happens uh, within milliseconds, uh, so there is zero impact to the developer at the end of the day uh, uh, to, in order to get their job done. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you guys both for your help with with setting up this webinar and telling us about the IDP that you built. Um, what might be more interesting to our audience is actually not how we use our IDP, but how some of our customers are using Portworks in their IDPs to do platform engineering. Um, if you scan this QR code that's on the slide that's being showed currently, um, this takes you to a video of our general manager, Murley, uh, talking to Ford about how they use platform engineering and they're using our software underneath to help with, their, with that as well. Uh, so that might be interesting to the audience. 
Um, also, if you're looking for more information about Portworks and the types of things that we do, um, check out the IDC Spotlight. Uh, IDC just came out with their with their new analyst rankings of container data management, and you're going to see Pure and Portworks at the top of that list. Um, but go and check that out if that that might be interesting to you, or go check out the blogs on our website. Uh, you can see some of the things I've written. Maybe you like those. I don't know. And then uh, we've also got some demos on YouTube. So if you look for the Portworks uh, channel on YouTube, there's a whole list of light boards and walkthroughs and all kinds of things about our products as well. So maybe that's also a bit interesting. Uh, just wanted to give you guys an extra thank you. I really appreciate you guys talking to us about how you built this IDP and answering some questions. And, uh, you know, can't thank you enough. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you. All right. Well, Eric, Rajan, and Charuda, thank you so much for joining us today on Tech Strong Learning. It's been such a pleasure hearing from you and, and watching this demo. So um, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to spend it here with us at Tech Strong Learning. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Cody. Thanks for having us. Of course. So before I release our audience, a couple of final notes. Today's session was recorded, and you will be receiving an email with the recording here shortly, as soon as that becomes available. But you can also find it living on the Cloud Native Now website. That's cloudnativenow.com slash webinars. We will be reaching out to two of our most engaged attendees to be receiving a $50 Amazon gift card. So. Thank you for your chats and your questions. And we really appreciate you filling out our post webinar survey that is attached both to the top of the chat as well as in the handouts. I'd like to thank Portworks for sponsoring this program today. And to our audience, thank you so much for spending the past hour here with us at TechStrong Learning. We hope to see you at a future TechStrong experience. Have a great rest of your day, and you may now disconnect. Thanks again, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.